Uh, hey, hey everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the um, to my talk, the AI Edge and the Storage Walk and to a Mongolian Mine. Uh, just a quick question: Who of you is working on some sort of edge compute? Most people. I, I was assuming that everyone's just here for Mongolian food and the weather. Uh, so uh, TLDR, I ended up, um, I, I got hired actually to do some uh, DevOps pipelines, and for some reason I ended up in the desert in Mongolia, just north of China, in one of the biggest uh, copper deposits in the world, and I ended up building a hybrid cloud, uh, uh, cloud-native edge AI uh, earthquake detection system, actually. Um, one... one Important takeaway, actually, to remember that I think um, some people in this community may have forgotten, I'm sure all of you know, is that runtime observability is absolutely amazing, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't prevent you from, from like designing uh, performance systems. So performance-based design is actually a, a term I, I copied from uh, structural engineering. It basically says you, you define your performance criteria and then you design your system based on that. Um, so uh, about me, I, I just um, I learned programming in uh, high school, cracking software. So I learned a lot of low-level stuff before I actually did anything useful. And then I had my wonderful Acer laptop, uh, which was so loud that everyone in the library in school hated me. And, um, and then I got like a webcam, and just nothing was working. Basically, that's how I got into open source. Um, I founded uh, Universal CTAX, um, Masataka-san then like, grew it into, like, basically we revived the CTAX project. And then if you do any kind of um, Mac OS virtualization in Linux, you probably run something I did. Um, I, I personally, like, I, th I think what, we, uh, what we're supposed to build is like, systems for domain experts to, to build good stuff without actually knowing anything about the system. Um, there are um, three kinds of um, edge AI components that I would, I would look at. Is, uh, one is the low-resource low SOC kind of uh, thing with an MPU. Um, the, the middle, which is, I guess, now much nicer to work with, which is uh, commodity hardware. Think of it as a Steam Deck in, in terms of your industrial compute and, and some industrial compute casing. You get 16 to 32 gigs, probably soon more. Uh, two and a half uh, gigs uh, per second, uh, NVMe usually, and then what most people actually use as uh, edge AI and talk about is the standard compute in either rack units or industrial casing. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump back and forth between some of these, uh, but if you, if you do the standard uh, rack units and you, you have your Kubernetes cluster, you have a um, pure LB or a metal LB in, in front of it, and then it's like, like most things you generally do, it doesn't really matter. If you do have an SOC kind of uh, situation, then um, you kind of need to think about, if you, for example, only have one, one gigabit per second, what are you replicating? How much of it are you replicating? Do you have like a single node cluster where you, where you replicate uh, some things or, or nothing at all because the storage is actually outside of the cluster? and the load balancing is outside of, outside of those like, compute units? Or do you um, think about using kind of a, a storage system where you, where you just mirror the whole thing, um, but then you still have the limitation in, in, uh, in both CPU and, um, and other performance? So I'm, I'm not going to talk about industrial IoT. I'd love to work on Cube Edge, but I've never had the opportunity. So. Um, Sorry. Um, a little background. I didn't know anything about mining when I started. Uh, basically, uh, whenever, you, when it, whenever you work in a mining environment, uh, you produce hundreds of mini, sometimes thousands of mini earthquakes uh, per day. You kind of need to model the stress of the environment because you don't want people to die. You don't want to have them get injured. Uh, if that happens, you have to shut down production. You don't want to do that. Uh, lawsuits incoming on top of that. And then at the same time, you want to make sure that you, you never stop your production. You make as much money as possible, obviously. Um, uh, like, so how do you model the stress? 
you when whenever a seismic event happens, like uh, two kinds of uh, waves are generated, waveforms are generated. One of them is faster than the other, and then by measuring uh, when they arrive at the different sensors, you can interlocate the event. And by interlocating uh, that and and taking the travel times, you can basically create something like a tomography, like like a CAT scan, but for for the ground and the environment. Uh, that's all measured with a, a geophone. Um, it's, it's a magnet suspended in a, in a spring. When the waves arrive, it just uh, starts uh, moving. There's a coil around it. It gen generates uh, velocity. So a um, couple of problems. We, we generate about one megabit uh, per second, a terabyte a day. But the entire facility's internet connectivity was just 100 megabits. So you can already see you can't send it to the cloud. You want to make sure that you, you only send the stuff that you actually need somewhere else. Uh, if it needs to be processed. Um, I couldn't actually go physically there in the beginning. So they have uh, quite stringent um, uh, like immigration policies. I guess for a European uh, that grew up in Germany, um, I, I used to like, worry about my biometric data. I used to like, not get my uh, you know, ID with biometric information as long as I could. And then you go to Mongolia, you go to like the, the office where you take your biometrics, they take a copy of your passport. There's like a staple there with like a bunch of copies of passports. You could just take them, nobody would notice. And then your biometric data is on a janky PC. Anyone could take it, you wouldn't notice. And so, you know, you realize you spent your life chasing a dream of privacy that is just not respected elsewhere in the world. Um, so anyway, we have storage limitations, we have uh, compute limitations, we have um, the basic problem where I speak to an IT department and I don't know what compute they have. So I have to kind of simulate something that I, I build based on my assumptions and then I have two weeks to deploy it all in an environment that I don't really know. So what, what, what would we like to have in, a, in like a normal environment? We'd, we'd like to have a Modbus, Ethernet, you know, MQTSN, it goes to an industrial MQTT gateway and then you send it to your time, like, time series thing on the cloud, which you can't do here. And then you just process your data and you build your standard environment around it. That's what you would like. So what do the scientists actually work with? They, they have these monstrous, uh, monstrous XML files. They have their own libraries to deal with them because it's not really humanly usable. And then they have their own time series um, storage format, which again has some metadata that is actually stored in the other XML formats as well. But what, do you, what did I actually get here? I, I got a data acquisition system, so with a like, proprietary sensing network that goes to a proprietary da data ac acquisition system. And they don't provide an API, they don't provide the documentation. So the first thing I needed to do was uh, get onto that system, reverse engineer the data format, um, and then reverse engineer the acquisition format. Then I just built a simple Go connector and I pushed the whole thing to Kafka and then uh, dumped it into TimescaleDB. DB. Because um, quick comment on Kafka, uh, a lot of people use it, you probably don't need it. Your consultant lied to you. The messages are probably too big, you don't want to use it. In this case, after actually extracting the data, it worked quite well. Um, containerization is usually not a problem, even if you have big, um, big like uh, data science kind of uh, containers with like TensorFlow and all sorts of other stuff in there that are, I don't know two gigs big. You don't really care about it. I mean, you should, but you don't really need to care about it because when it goes to your artifact registry from the from the CI and GKE pulls it, it doesn't really take that much time. I mean, it takes some time, but it's it's not going to kill you if you don't pay attention to it. In this case, I had a hard drive, and I had two weeks to go there. And then um, in, for updates, there's, a, there's like you want to keep the software delta as small as possible. That means, obviously, that the, um, there's, a, there's a problem with dependency and security there. But if it is an agapt environment, you, you have a different attack vector. Uh, so what, what did we look at in terms of storage? So I actually, the initial. All the initial deployments, uh, there's a mention on Ansible in the beginning, were done with Ansible-based things. So uh, I use KubeSpray. I noticed they have a stand down there. They've like, improved a lot of things over the years. 
Um, I actually used Gluster in the beginning. It was a complete nightmare, I will say. Um, Ceph actually nowadays with Rook is a delight to use, even though it's not always very performant. Uh, these environments all have a data center, so they all have a hyperconverged uh, storage rack somewhere that you will not get access to, at least not in the beginning. Uh, Longhorn, if you guys know the call me maybe joke, then uh, from uh, the distributed computing environment, uh, you, you will notice that sometimes when the data is gone, it's gone and you can't recover it. I think the Longhorn um, uh, consistency model is a little bit based on the fact that you want, they want you to have a mirror somewhere else. Like you, you basically um, mirror to another site, which isn't really feasible in this environment. Minio, uh, most of the times you can forget about it. One file uh, per object is a complete uh, performance killer if you do any, anything that has um, anything to do with... Uh, if you, if you do anything that has anything to do with um, small files, lots of small files, Minio is going to kill you. A lot of appliances, TrueNAS included, actually do use Minio for their S3 layer. Seaweed FS doesn't have that problem. Uh, I just mentioned it there. I will talk about it a little bit later. Okay. So I used a bunch of different pipeline tools. I used Pachyderm, I, I did uh, an environment in Spark, I did an environment in Airflow, I did an environment in a bunch of other ones that I don't actually remember right now. And um, one of the things that most of these have in common when they deal with passing data around is actually to, um, to have immutable artifacts at the end of each step. The idea is that when you have a problem, you basically, uh, you get to go to every step, like redo the next step and like figure out what you want to do there. That's, that's nice, except um, it may not fit your purpose. And it, it, the, the premise that every of these pipelines have, that it will just magically solve your, your chaining of functions, is not uh, necessarily accurate. I powered a little bit through the slides without paying attention to time. Um, so what you want to do, what we used to do in the past, is you profile your code. So like, especially in an environment where you're limited in compute, you need to profile your code. Like eBPF is awesome. We have all these uh, observability talks. We have a bunch of eBPF like, solutions, but like, they, they're, not, they're not going to excuse bad design. They're not going to solve, magically solve the problems that you created before you actually deployed your stuff in that environment. So um, I, I just, uh, I don't know how many of you used to do database stuff in, in, uh, a few decades ago, but uh, at some point, every SaaS platform started running into database problems because their ORMs used to uh, serialize and deserialize huge amounts of junk. Yeah, so turns out in this particular instance, with the background that I told you about the storage formats that they have, uh, a lot of uh, I.O. actually is what, what the entire compute time is spent on when you throw it into these uh, pipeline systems. Okay. So the consistency model here, if you think about it, is we, we, have these, we have these windows of time where an event occurs, when an, when an event of uh, importance occurs or of not importance. So a blast, uh, something else, uh, you need to be able to gather all the sensor data from that particular window and, um, and correlate it to each other. Once you have correlated it and stored it somewhere, you don't necessarily need it. It's nice if you can store it, um, in, in the event that you can store it somewhere, you want to store it somewhere, but in the event that you cannot, you don't have uh, the, the bandwidth or the capacity, you can discard all the other data once you've located these events. And 
obviously then the the question like you you have to pay a little bit attention to how much detail like how um how how like uh like how uh, what is the word like how um uh what your tolerance on that on that event is like obviously if if you have a lot of space you can like you can store events that are probably noise but you might want to get something out of later um for the jobs uh i decided in this case actually instead of uh, like after i evaluated all of these things to just go for a redis queue and i don't really care if the jobs like if 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 the redis dies um which it doesn't generally but if it dies the job can be rescheduled there's no real necessity there for um for for consistency and the same goes for the artifacts that are temporary in between so if if those disappear we just re regenerate them because after um improving the whole thing the 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 goal is to have a, a reproducible artifact from end to finish and as long as it's reproducible and it computes in the um reasonable amount of time we can just rerun it we don't care if the if that or if like something happens in between you need to make sure obviously that your that your uh time scale uh hypertable like uh discards all data you have to make sure that your kafka discards all data um and um yeah that's it so so quick recap this is actually um a fairly simple architecture if you think about it uh so we, I use the Kafka for stream ingestion, which we don't need if we actually had access directly to the sensor data, because we could stream it directly into uh, into an uh, MQTT ingester. And then um, the the Kafka streams connector like dumps it into the time scale, and then the pipeline framework, um, which is a domain specific framework that I wrote, uh, allows the scientists to just like hammer away on that data. The thing that's important is I, I don't know how many how many of you have worked with like scientists that write Jupyter notebooks. Yeah. Okay. So so you know that when they write Jupyter notebooks, it's not necessarily something you can use. And like if if you don't force them into a structure, then you get a notebook where you're going to spend a lot of time trying to get this into some sort of uh, production state. So what you want to do is actually build them a framework where they where they have their building blocks all the building blocks that they want and if they then use uh um uh like if, if they then use their jupyter notebook to do whatever they want you can still use that code afterwards because it has like it has like a base structure it's like it's, it's kind of the web framework of the scientists um if a few things I, I really like, I have been uh, trying to integrate and uh, move into, but I have not uh, finished yet, is um, I, I quite like both NATS and SeaweedFS. SeaweedFS has an important caveat that you need to consider, uh, which is that when the amount of uh, small files that you have grow, so as, as the amount of files that you have in that file system grows, the, the memory that it uses uh, scales uh, in, in relation to that. So you have to make sure that you kind of understand what the what the scope of your data is, how many like the, how much data you're generating. In this in this particular instance, when we generate those travel times, uh, there is a problem because it's it's like it's a really old code base. I've been trying to um, migrate some of it to Rust. It's what scientists use, and it just generates a lot of small files and um, but both of these projects, if you look at their GitHub issues, you will see that they, they understand distributed systems. They pay attention to it in their design. They were not audited, so there is a possibility that it will still like, you know, but, <laughs> but at, least, at least they're trying and at least it's part of their architecture. Uh, Nat says something that Redis doesn't have, for example, which is auto reconnect logic in, in any queuing solution that you have with Redis, that logic is usually in some sort of library. Here, it's part of the architecture. Uh, Jetstream is something I thought might be really nice for storing those artifacts, those temporary artifacts in between for the pipelines. And 
CubeFS is actually um, a very interesting project from Oppo, which they actually specifically designed to address some of the issues they had with Ceph. And it, in part, part of their um, part of their design actually specifically addresses uh, storing small files. So, uh, for the model training, um, the the, sci the scientists need access to useful data. So th there's like a couple of problems here. Enterprises don't want to share data, but they should. If they don't share it, then you're, they're, they're just wasting everyone's time. But w when they do it, how do you share it well? So you don't really want to have an API where, where you're constantly pulling data. You don't want to share the entire blob storage with, um, with the scientists. Um, you you kind of want to have them access the streams as something transparent in their code. So uh, TileDB is an um, is, um, interesting, in my opinion, concept, which uh, follows a little bit the design of InfluxDB 3 uh, for, um, for the way they store data. The performance very much depends on how, um, like how you structure the streams that you store, the time series streams. And it's basically an array store um, for, for designed actually for scientists. And then you can mirror a, a partial, uh, like a, a part of that TileDB to the scientist um, environment. Okay. So this, by the way, is a uh, lamp head. I had in Mongolia, it was delicious. Um, the, the, I, I guess the lesson you can take here is that um, in Mongolia, they, they respect the animals, they feed them well, they raise them well, and then they use every part of it. And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, treat your Kubernetes well, and then it will be a treat to you. Okay, so uh, a quick recap. So like every pipeline system you look at will tell you this is the one that solves all your problems. And it might if it's actually addressing your problem. So you, you kind of need to know what problem you're trying to solve. Um, the messaging uh, bus is the same thing. So um, I, I, I took the example of Kafka. Um, th this, this has been iterated over and over. Like you kind of need to know what kind of packages you send. You need to, you need to know like what you want to send, how big it is, how much of it goes through, and then that's when you choose uh, whatever solution you take. Uh, in such an environment, especially if you want to design it for the, for the SOC kind of size, then you actually really need to think about how many replicas you have, uh, how much uh, data replication you have. It affects your bandwidth available, it affects your uh, CPU time, it affects your memory, like all of these things are part of it. If you, if you do take runtime uh, observability and you add it on top of it, it's going to affect your memory. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's going to affect your memory. It's going to affect your CPU. Like um, I, I, I tested a bunch of pipelines, uh, a, a bunch of uh, Kubernetes distributions. Some of them were not exactly a delight. Uh, some storage solutions are not uh, something you should use. And I will tell most people should not start with a uh, cloud-native storage solution. Un unless you have to, unless you know exactly what you're doing, don't use it. Like, buy a TrueNAS, it's, it costs about as much as like a, a cloud-native solution architect, and you, you have it for a while, and then you, and then you can build your actual um, like software-defined storage if you need to, again. Uh, cloud IOPS, it, I didn't really mention it here, it's a bit uh, related to the fact that I simulated everything on the cloud. And then turns out uh, those IOPS numbers you see on Azure website don't really apply until you do other things or you, you, um, you provision a lot of uh, data and then suddenly it gets very expensive. So um, these are all things to consider. Um, but I guess the summary is I, I basically got hired to just containerize some code, some scientific code, and ended up uh, saving some lives in the Mongolian mine. Um, yeah, so I, 
I'd love to work more on this. I'd love to talk about these things. If someone has any suggestions, if anyone has like uh, ideas on how to do things better and how to how to like turn this into something more, like come talk to me. I actually have pineapple cake from Taiwan that I brought with me. So there's the there's the coffee break in the moment. If you want some pineapple cake and talk, come find me. Any questions? No questions. No, no, no. Well, the food was great. The desert is actually not as cold as you think it is. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Reza, just one, one yes, go small ahead. question. Uh, when you use the uh, share for whatever storage you tried there, yeah. uh, you use RWX mode or Sorry. RWO? You needed the files to be accessed by multiple consumers? Yes. So, th yes. One of, the, one of the biggest issues is that the, um, the, I, I mentioned the small files a lot. I didn't actually mention why. So, um, those travel time tables you need to you need to um, you need to basically uh, load into either load into memory or load them really quickly. If you use a normal one of these, uh, so so for example, if you use Minio, it's way too slow. You cannot uh, you you can't load it into memory for uh, at at any kind of reasonable speed. So basically, um, you uh, when you if you cannot read it into memory fast enough, you cannot actually scale your functions. So you have to make sure that they're, they're running constantly. And then um, the, the, the issue there is that uh, all of these functions access the, the same, that same thing because you need to generate it. So you, need, you need to regenerate the, the uh, velocity model. And so you also don't want to regenerate this velocity model every, uh, all the time. And again, you have the same problem where when your storage is low and you regenerate this, it's just, it's just going to take like, a lot of time which, which you actually want to use to process the data. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone.